Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. I'm just like amazed that Saddam Hussein was specifically trying to get your dad. This is Taban. As a child, she was nearly buried alive, somehow miraculously escaping this horrific potential death. She was trapped in a war zone for nearly two years, navigating the awful genocide of the Kursan people. As an adult, she ended up in an abusive relationship in the UK, trapped once again. Just a few years later, the hardship continued even more, with her ending up hospitalized for two years, being trapped in her own body. And so how is Taban now? Do you think you're a free human? 1000%. <laughs> she is now the founder of Lotus Flower Organization, enabling displaced women and girls to build sustainable futures. Taban is thriving and glowing. She understands what it's like to live through hell on earth, and with that, she's grateful for every moment of freedom she now experiences. Oof, I can't wait for you all to hear this story. I'm actually very nervous, but I'm excited for this trip to be another opportunity for me to rewrite the narrative of the world. This is not how I envisioned myself to get to Iraq all by myself. My videographer isn't coming with me. He didn't have his passport extended for long enough. So I'm going solo and I'm not sure how I feel about that, but I'm gonna be landing in good hands, I hope. But yeah, Iraq by myself, filming a free human episode. Was not expecting this. Challenge accepted. three pivotal moments that have imprisoned you that you mentioned to me before and that's why you now have specified like the free human concept does resonate with you can we start with the very first one that you had well, i think the first one is free from persecution and having your human rights violated so i was a child political prisoner i was destined to be buried alive from that moment like knowing what it's like to be imprisoned and to have your life taken away and to be persecuted. That's one of the most imprisoning things and the first way that you can take someone's freedom is by literally taking it away and imprisoning them. Can we expand on that a little bit? <laughs> I don't want to skim over that. <laughs> oh yeah, I was almost buried alive. <laughs> yeah. I, I was born in Kurdistan in northern Iraq. My dad was a freedom fighter, so a Peshmerga and a poet. And his political activism is the reason why we were captured. The way that they would normally capture the men is by capturing the families to try and get as much information out of them as possible. So we were taken, and I, I remember it very clearly, I was in my grandmother's garden playing as a child, as you do. Iraqi soldiers came to my grandma's house and they persisted and asked for my mum and just said, we want to take her in for questioning. And when they took her, we were driven to what I call an ethnic camp because it was a prison, but it was only for Kurdish people. So you had women and children in one and you had the men in another. We spent two weeks there until they called some family names. We were on the list, so everyone thought that we'd been rescued. When the adults went out, that's when all the screams and cries started. And it's because there was a digger in front of the buses and they knew that at that time they would bury people alive. And then they'll use the smallest thing to shovel soil over you. So it's a very slow, torturous death. I think my freedom of voice, to use my voice, kind of started from being silenced from that moment. Because I do distinctly remember that being quiet was what I needed to do. I don't know how to describe it, but when your voice is taken away, your freedom is taken away. Just in 2021 alone, there were 89.3 million people worldwide forcibly displaced. When your life has been ripped away from you, where do you go? Taban founded Lotus Flower in 2016, and the mission of this organization? It is to give women and girls affected by conflict the strength and support they need to rise out of darkness, moving from past suffering and economic hardship to reach their full potential to rebuild their future. We just arrived at the offices of Lotus Flower. Now, this is a pretty serious organization. I can't say I knew how big Lotus Flower was when Taban sent me a DM saying like, hey, I work in the Middle East. <laughs> I had no idea that she has 200 staff. And here we have like 85. She's taken over this side of the street and this side of the street. She has a child protection unit. She's got general protection unit, mental health unit. She is really taking the holistic approach to everything in this organization, which is very special. And yet again, every single one of the people on the ground, every single one of them 
is local. This is a organization that primarily helps women. So this is very, very cool to see that the males are really involved. It's like a 50-50 split. Secondly, these people, they are so in love with what they do. They're so proud of what they've created. They're so proud of the organization. You can see it. And they don't need Taban. Taban is actually just here like, cool. <laughs> this is amazing what's going on because she really wants to hand over the responsibilities to people. She doesn't want to micromanage. Like, this is far bigger than herself. And you can see that the people have taken ownership of this company and everything that's happening. And their reward is taking care of children and women. How did Taban escape her first prison? We didn't know at that time you had Kurds working for Saddam Hussein who were working for Kurds to rescue them. They also had Kurds working for Saddam Hussein to actually kill Kurds. So it was in both scenarios. The first scenario is what we experienced and the drivers had switched. So when they opened the doors, they said, we're Kurdish and we're not gonna kill you. Please disappear because if you're caught again, you'll be killed on the spot. We made our way to a road. This is when our family had reunited. So my grandfather was back with us, my grandmother, all of us together. And he stopped a taxi. And that taxi happened to be one of his old students, which was so surreal. Like from, of all places, of all people to stop you, it was an old student. So we went to the south of Iraq and went into hiding. Because it's Arab populated, it's the least likely place that they would search. But it meant that as a child, my freedom was completely gone. I was not allowed out the house because I spoke Kurdish and not Arabic. It was being imprisoned in the house now. So we stayed there for about three months until my mum realized there's no way that we can live like this. We've got essentially a death sentence on us. That started the journey of fleeing, I guess but this is during the Iran and Iraq war. So Iran and Iraq war, you'd have all the bombs dropping in the rural regions. We couldn't go back to the cities because we had the Saddam war to deal with in terms of the genocide. So we were stuck between two kind of conflicts and didn't really know which way to go. The safest place for us to go was actually through the bombs and bullets of the rural areas. When bombs drop, I hope no one ever experiences this, but there's a sound that comes with it. And as soon as you hear the sound, you close your eyes and you're almost just praying it doesn't drop on you. Imagine going through that constantly throughout the day for like 12 months. So that's what we had to go through. Why did I decide to travel 7,000 kilometers to Erbil, Iraq? I had to see for myself the work that has been done by Taban and the giant team at Lotus Flower inside the refugee camps themselves where the displaced women and children are living. lost loved ones and suffered rape and sexual assault and in camps they are prone to further gender-based violence and harassment. Lotus Flower is actively working to combat this and this leads to their significant impact of thus far positively impacting 61,259 people through their centers and this all began with one woman. I was just like <laughs> amazed that Saddam Hussein was specifically trying to get your dad and other freedom yeah. fighters of course but like that is that means that you really were on the wanted list i mean lots of men were wanted lots of people were wanted but he was wanted a lot more because he had a gun as a freedom fighter but he also had a pen for his poetry and his poetry was invoking people to uprise so he had both the fighting and the, the intellectual side and the creative side it was almost as if he had two guns and so for him that's one of the main reasons why he was wanted. And the way they get them is by making sure the families are caught. But my dad had been targeted and they paid or they hired a husband and wife to poison this group. And we have a yogurt drink. They put the poison in the yogurt drink. My dad and two other guys had drunk enough to make them critically ill. So they needed medical attention and that's when they took them to Iran. We saw him for the first night and he was critically poisoned. By the morning, Amnesty International picked up on the story and flew him to the UK to get medical treatment. And we had to wait a year before we arrived in the UK. So that's when so, you fled out of this whole conflict, but it was years of turmoil, years of uncertainty. As yeah. a little kid, you were four yeah. years old? Four years old and I arrived in the UK at the age of six. Oh wow. So two years of absolute hell. Yeah. So 
child that no child should experience, but sadly, many still do. Hello, hello. So we have just arrived at the centre, the Lotus Flower Centre here in one of the camps. And it's got a computer room, it's got a library, it's got a gym, we've got a, a communal garden where lots of events happen, so we're about to listen to some music as well. Everything that is part of the centres and uh, provided to the camps is because it's been requested by people that live in the camps. So they have said, hey, we really want to learn these skills, this is how we want to advance. And so then the projects are implemented. So behind me right now is the literacy school, and these are women that never had a chance to actually go to school themselves. So we have women that are I'm going to say between 30 to 50, 60, and then they are learning the basics of Arabic right now. So, every age. managed to get to the UK. So that was the first moment where you escaped the first prison that you encountered in your life. Yeah. I guess little did you know that you still had more big imprisonment moments in your life. Yeah. Can you talk us through the next one? So I'll fast forward to the moment where I got married, I'd say at an early age. And that was at the age of 18 engaged, 19 married, 20 when I had my son. At the time that I got engaged, it was an era where in my culture, a lot of things were taboo for women. You couldn't really get divorced. Before then, you couldn't have any boyfriends or relationships or like anyone. Like, you just had to follow the first route of traditional marriage. And I guess I chose to do it because I thought that's the right thing you do in my culture. But actually, having done lots of therapy now, it's not. It's because I was just seeking to be loved because mm. I missed so much of that from my childhood. Not because my parents didn't want to give it to me, but because we were too busy trying to survive death. So we didn't get our basic needs met from a feelings perspective. And so I grew up trying to search for it, but in the wrong ways. But what that meant was that I landed myself in a marriage which was very abusive. I mean, coercive control. So I had emotional, mental, physical abuse. The way coercive control works is that it chips away at you slowly and it just takes slow bits. I wasn't allowed to have my friends, so I cut off from all my friends. Every single day was a fight. Like, I don't remember a single day where there wasn't an argument or a fight. What I realized was I was a prisoner. I was a prisoner in my own body because my body was physically there, but my emotions, my mind, it was all trapped inside. I had zero confidence, so much fear, social anxiety. I would be questioning everything I did. I self-sabotage. I couldn't look at people in the eye. I couldn't go out in public. My mind and soul were in prison this time. You know, I've experienced being in prison physically, but this time, it was my mind and soul, because I could see everything happening, but I was trapped. So this is pretty great. Now we are visiting small businesses that are created by women that are approaching Lotus Flower to assist them with funding ideas that they have. So they will receive a little bit of money after they've done like a three month business training program. They'd have to do their own market research to figure out if this business idea is actually needed in the camps. And the crazy thing is, is that it's a 100% success rate. So these women do so much market research. They have three months of business training and then the demand is so high because there's, these services are just not here. So all of a sudden they become super busy. There's a lot of income that is made from this. They can sustain themselves, these women and their families and the communities. So yeah, it's pretty special. So you managed to escape the first prison, which is a physical fr prison, thanks to the universe wanting you to live on, <laughs> which now knowing what you've created in the world, I can see why. And so that one was, well, you were very young. For you to actually escape that, you needed people's assistance on that. Yeah. You couldn't do it by yourself. Yeah. The next prison, which is the mind, 
and the soul. So not only have you got a marriage that you feel like you're trapped in, but then your outer world is also telling you to stay. And so you have to go against so many voices to say, no, my life is worth more than this. I deserve more than this. Some people don't get to that point. Some people can never break through that point. How were you able to get out? Another miracle, I'd say. I used to take my, my son was in reception, so he was around four, drop him off without looking up. Like the teachers actually thought I didn't speak English. That's how detached I was from them. On the last day of school term, one of the teachers ran over to me and just held my hand and said, please, 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 can I do 10 Reiki sessions on you for free? And I looked at her on there going, what the hell's Reiki? <laughs> what are you talking about? So I said, yes. And it's so surreal when I look back, I'm like, she was one of the angels around me 100% she would come in the house. She knew that I couldn't talk and didn't want to talk or wasn't ready to talk. Do the healing and then go back out for 10 sessions, 10 times. A month after the 10th session, I remember I was meant to go to like a work do and I never went to anything because he's never let me. And I started to feel quite weird because they would question and I wanted the questions to stop. So how do I stop these questions is if I show my face to one of these things and then maybe they'll stop. So I begged him and said, please let me go. He said, yeah, sure, take this camera. So I went to the do and I took photos and went back. And the first thing that he asked for when I went back was, let me see the camera, which I found quite strange. And then I realized, oh, he's given me the camera to track what I was doing. And he looked through the photos and said, and it was a team shot, and we have a mixed team, but it was a team shot. I was standing next to a male member and he fixated on that photo and said, why is he standing next to you? I just remember looking at him and going, wait, I'm either gonna live like this forever. I'm already sick, so the next option is I'll most probably get cancer or die. If I leave, he's already threatened to kill me. So both scenarios have got death. I think I'd rather die now. And that's the decision that I made on that spot was if he's going to kill me like he says he will and he's threatened me so many times, I think I'd rather be dead than live that life with him of being dead with my mind and soul. And that was it. I just turned around and said, I'm leaving you and you can kill me if you want, but that's it. Oh my God, come on, you did it. Yeah. The second prison? It was out, the second prison was out. When I accepted Taban's invitation to visit, I truly had no idea what I was getting myself into. I had never been into a refugee camp. I had never really spoken to any genocide survivors and I wanted to find out more information firsthand. I wanted to experience what it's like to be in those camps and see the impact with my own eyes. Just giving people a place to go with hope, with education, with activities, with music, with boxing, with gyms, with libraries, with art. You can just see by the people that we've met how much that means to them. They're even growing vegetables. All right, so we have eight women that run these eight greenhouses. And sometimes their families are allowed to come in, so, but it is run by the women and they chose to have this. And because their skills um, back, in, back before they were displaced um, we're farming, they're smashing it, they're nailing it. This was only started a few months ago and now they're ready for harvesting. So they are really progressing with this so fast. Oh my God. They have space for some of the Kurdistan farmers who are experts at this field to grow their own vegetables, to feed their own communities. And the most amazing thing about Lotus Flower that I am still digesting is that this is a pretty new organization and the scale of this organization is huge. And the impact is enormous because they truly use the majority of the investing and the funds that are donated to them to the actual causes. Unlike so many charities where the money goes into marketing. Nope, Taban is on the front line and she's ensuring that the money goes exactly where it is needed. I am so grateful for people like you, Taban. <laughs> More of this in the world, please. I was just telling Taban about my Krav Maga days when I was learning to do Krav Maga. And this reminds me of that a little bit because I got to train with one of the best Krav Maga instructors in the world. And like the confidence boost that he gave me as well. Like we did a lot of boxing, so I know how this translates for these women as well and these girls. Yeah, that little dash of confidence to stand taller, to feel better about yourself, to feel more badass. So cool. That's just wild to think that you had to go through another giant lesson like that. It feels unfair. Was there a point at this time that you were thinking life you are being really mean to me. Like, what is this? Like, I've gone through hell and now you want me to do it again? Were you angry at life? Were you bitter? I was so determined to live. Why? I just remember 
being so broken, physically, health-wise, mentally, because of what I've gone through and emotionally. I was so broken, but I was still physically here. And I remember thinking, this isn't it, Taban. I can see that tiny flame. There was a tiny, tiny flame burning. How can I set that flame on fire? And that was my mission. That became my mission was, I can see a tiny flicker of a flame inside you. What do I do to set it on fire? And I accepted it was one step at a time. So I slowly rebuilt my confidence. I slowly rebuilt my friend circle. I got myself a career. I bought myself a house. And when you do one, you're like, oh, I've done that. I can do another. And then it just that freedom of being able to move outside your comfort zones was phenomenal. For most people, we'd think, okay, I've gone through my fair share of lessons. Thank you, universe. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> but no. There is more. <laughs> there is more. <laughs> Dishing it out, but not in the, not in the most pleasurable way, I would no, say. No. Freedom taken away, number three. Prison, number three. Health. That was a big one. So I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease at the age of 21. I didn't understand then how it would get people housebound. I just didn't realize, but in 2018, my health deteriorated. So I went back into a relapse. That relapse was so aggressive. It was almost as if my body was being eaten alive from the inside. So I was housebound. And when I say this to people, they're like, but why, how? I'm like, you try going to the toilet 50 times a day. You try not being able to walk. You try having severe anxiety because there isn't a toilet in sight. It made me housebound. I got worse and worse and then I stopped eating so I was given the feed feeding tube so that was the second year and then they gave me a colostomy bag that didn't work and then in the third year I mean I'd spent so much time in hospital by now and I wasn't eating for two years the only way to save me was to give me a permanent stoma bag and to remove all of my large intestines I came out of that I still ran my organization from my hospital bed I still did webinars from hospital bed meetings. I put signs up and say, no, I'm in a meeting, you can't come in. At one point, the doctor came in and said, oh, Taban, don't be too scared. You might wake up in ICU. And I looked at her and went, I don't think so. I've got a meeting in the morning. <laughs> But it kept me going. So that routine, I mean, I'm not encouraging people to be workaholics, but in that moment, for me, it's the only thing I had. If I've managed to survive that, then there's my third prison gone, like physically health bound prison. But now I don't think anything can imprison me because I'll find a way out. There is a way out. And I believe that, I genuinely deeply believe that to be a free human, you have to have a creative way of thinking about problems and solutions, knowing you'll be free from whatever it is. And it could be health, it could be any scenario, but knowing that you're the only person can set yourself free from it. And that freedom can take many forms, but I've managed to reclaim them. So knowing that I can reclaim it is so powerful. So there's no fear of not being free because I know at the end of it, the power of being free is always in your hands. Whoa. Do you think you're a free human? 1,000%. 1,000%, yeah. It took a long time to get here, but I wouldn't change any of my lessons because those lessons make me realize you can be a free human over and over and over again. Oh my gosh. Because it's like life will throw you down just to see you like remember remember you can you can and you've gone you've you haven't done small lessons you've really gone deep but i also just realized that you had a common theme throughout your life of having to go through these lessons quite alone and so i'm not surprised that now you have 200 staff that are helping all these women children some men that are going through these very isolating moments and you're helping to free them but you're you're giving them the tools you're not doing it for them yeah you're helping you're assisting you're giving them the yeah. tools and you're asking what do they need yeah and they come up with their own solution that's the whole point i mean that's the thing is that i've always said what can i do to help someone heal learn and grow and set themselves free i don't need to go in there saving anyone because actually everything is inside them they just need the tools to be able to do it i am so glad i visited taban and i saw firsthand the impact this woman and her team have on thousands of lives and lotus flower is just 
beginning. So with our further donations and support, the positive impact is endless. So consider donating now. The link in the bio. Any amount will truly help. Thank you, Daban, for so selflessly dedicating your life to such important causes. I am in awe of you, not only for what you do in the world, but also that throughout all the hardship you have experienced, you've remained loving, caring, so joyful, and your heart is still cracked open. Follow Daban further on her journey through the link in the bio, and I will see you all in the next Free Human episode. Thank you so much for watching. Now it's time to thank the sponsor of today's video, which is Squarespace, an all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Let's talk about the amazing features of Squarespace. Online store. Sell your products on an online store. Whether you sell physical, digital, or service products, Squarespace has the tools you need to start selling online. Appointments. Accept appointments on your Squarespace website. Offer online or in-person private sessions, workshops, and group classes. They provide everything you need to manage your schedule, accept secure payments, send automatic reminders, beautifully showcase your services, and more. With Fluid Engine, a next-generation website design system from Squarespace, it's never been easier for anyone to unlock unbreakable creativity. Start with the best-in-class website template and customize every design detail with reimagined drag-and-drop technology for desktop or mobile. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you are ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash Sorel to save 10% of your first purchase of a website or domain.